this episode of Shop Talk, we are going to be exploring the Nouveau Trumpet. Uh, I want you to really understand where I'm coming from with that design, as well as uh, what really inspired me to become a trumpet builder and an inventor in the first place. So the Nouveau Trumpet is really formed around the concept of the Art Nouveau period and that's a really cool period because design was the center of attention when uh, a lot of these really organic ideas were incorporated into architecture uh, all the way to you know home furnishings and greeting cards everything else uh, advertising especially so the Art Nouveau period for me has been really attractive mainly because we're incorporating a lot of different um, natural components into the design. For instance, on the Nouveau Brace, I have incorporated the, I'm looking here to see if we can show that up. There we go. I'm, I've incorporated the Nautilus shell. So you can see some of the inspiration from the Nautilus shell. And the reason I wanted that in here is because I want it to be inspired by nature and I want it to look organic. That's really the essence of Art Nouveau. And uh, the first Nouveau trumpet was built many years ago. I believe the first one was in maybe 2002 or three. Um, it took me probably a year to really get that uh, down and have the first one out. The very first Nouveau trumpet was a box Stradivarius that I modified into a Nouveau trumpet. That was because I didn't have all of the uh, components at my disposal and all the techniques to build my own lead pipes or bells or valve sets. So I used a Bach trumpet and took it all apart and put it back together and uh, we can see a photo of it here. So the Nouveau trumpet was just this beautiful new idea that I came out with I, relatively early in trumpet design at least for, for what I've done but in comparing to other things that have been designed out there I realize now that I was really ahead of uh, pretty much everybody in trumpet design uh, in my era or in my generation of designing. Uh, but when you go back far enough, you start to see some of these uh, different deco and nouveau uh, elements incorporated in a lot of different horns by Kahn, by Holton, um, and quite a few other manufacturers. They incorporated things that really just fit in with the times. They just didn't have the fabrication or machinery to do it as much as we can today. So that's really um, maybe why you don't see as much of it incorporated, but if you look at trumpet mouthpieces from the past, you'll see some really cool stuff that was definitely deco or Art Nouveau. So why would I be compelled to build trumpets in the first place? Well, let's go back to why I was compelled to build anything in the first place. And that was mainly because as a child, I had to spend a lot of my time uh, really coming up with things to do on my own. And my sister had the same uh, challenge because we grew up for several years in a semi truck. My parents were truck drivers. We traveled around the country and uh, we were in a different city or, or on the road, a different place every day. And I personally loved that lifestyle. I loved being on the road and exploring new things, learning new things about the world. And uh, to me, it was a, a normal way of life. Going to school was the difficult part of my childhood. And I have to admit that uh, I really didn't like school very much, mostly because you were expected to sit in a chair at a desk for almost the entire day. Now, that may sound like it doesn't make sense because I was stuck in a semi, but the truth is I could move around in a semi. I could also direct my own thoughts and uh, really come up with things to do on my own. I didn't have to sit there for an hour and follow a, a teacher or a group through a, a math uh, project or read a book or something, this or that. So my brain really does not like to go into the phase of uh, you need to do these things right now for the next hour and they are unrelated to what you really want to do. Uh, I know a lot of people are very good at that and then they can take tests and they're great at tests, so on and so forth. For me, I'm a different animal. I definitely love to just lead my own thoughts and my own actions and then come up with things on my own. Uh, so as a young boy, I decided I really want to be an inventor. And my parents really encouraged that idea, that concept of just making things myself. 
and uh, same with my sister. So we would spend a lot of times by ourselves where our parents were maybe unloading or loading a truck or doing paperwork or something else. And we would literally, my sister and I, be there by ourselves. A lot of people would want to say, oh my God, that's so terrible. Why would they leave you? Well, the truth is, that's the best thing you could ever do for a kid. Um, so we learned to come up with things and use our imaginations. We created a lot of songs and a lot of games and, you know, we had a pencil and a paper and maybe some crayons and we came up with these fantastic things all the time. And I was always inventing something new and uh, I couldn't wait to get off the road because we would stop and live with relatives or eventually at home. And I couldn't wait to get off the road sometimes and really just try out some new ideas. But I, was, I found myself driving past things and asking my dad, hey, how does this work or what does this do, so on and so forth. And he would explain to me in great detail how things worked. So as a young boy, he had explained to me all kinds of things you would never guess um, that I would take so seriously or really think about so deeply. For instance, um, I wanted to understand how vehicles worked because we're around them all the time. When we go to a truck stop, they'd have to repair something, maybe change the tires um, or the brakes or change the fluids, whatever it might be, or just even repair the engine. And uh, my dad was a mechanic as well, so he wasn't afraid to just show me. So we would get out of the semi, and at times he would literally pull the whole hood off of the semi, which was the whole front end of the truck, and uh, show me what was inside. Uh, a lot of times he did that because he had to fix something, and he wanted me to help him. So I learned how engines work, you know, like a combustion engine, how a diesel engine is different from a regular combustion engine. And I learned transmissions. I learned all the little components in there because he taught me as a young boy. So I'm guessing by the time I was eight or nine years old, I had a pretty firm understanding of how an entire engine, transmission, drivetrain, all of it worked. And I also had a good idea of how airplane engines worked, uh, the different types, you know, jet engines compared to um, other rotary engines. Uh, there are a lot of different components out there that, that work. And I found myself just really exploring in my own mind how do things work electronically um, or mechanically. And then I became addicted to understanding this. And that sounds like the makings of an engineer, uh, which I would say that's true. But an inventor is a little different than an engineer because I wanted to solve problems. Have you guys ever found yourselves thinking, man, I wish that whatever existed so I could solve my problem? I'm pretty sure all of you have thought that way and you've thought, uh, man, if I can only make that, and maybe some of you have made it, maybe some of you are makers uh, or engineers or even inventors. Uh, the reason you started making all those things is usually because you wanted to solve a problem. And I find myself uh, really trying to solve problems all the time. The biggest uh, challenge I have is how much time it takes to solve a problem with a new invention or a better version of a previous invention and then how to make that uh, the best version of itself while then giving yourself enough time in your lifetime to then go on to the next invention. Because the reality is you get through three or four ideas and you've spent sometimes years of your life trying to refine these things. And that's uh, really, you know, sums up a lot of my life has been really diving into things so deep that I can make the best version of it possible then move on to the next idea. And uh, the cool thing is I've made a lot of things that weren't perfect on the side, so I've been making a lot of different things. And that's why we have the Let's Make This channel launching on YouTube. So if you're really interested in how things are made, I would check out Let's Make This. It's its own separate YouTube page, and uh, I'm the host of that. And I show people how we make things. And uh, I'll just show you a few of the things uh, that are on that channel. So we're going to be discovering how to make house numbers. And this was just a prototype set. Um, We'll be using 3D printers so you can see how we make things like this model. Um, we'll also be using lasers. So this laser made this uh, with a little design. You can do a lot of things like that. And uh, this is just uh, part of a handle for an ax that I'm building. I'll show you how to hand file and hand carve jewelry or some things like this uh, artistic bottom cap. And uh, it's just going to be a fun place uh, where you can see how things are made. We'll also feature how I made some of the braces for the Nouveau Trumpet on that page. Uh, so like I said, this uh, episode is really about the Nouveau and what inspired me to build trumpets. Those are two very different things, but they're related because we're building a trumpet. So 
Um, what inspired me to make trumpets? Well, I really wanted to make things as a child. I made a lot of different inventions as a child, um, and that led up to me really trying to figure out what I was going to do when I finished high school. And my first option was just to work. Uh, I didn't come from a family where uh, everyone went to college and we had these amazing professions. Uh, my family was a little different, uh, or I should say a little more common. Uh, so my mom worked for the post office. Uh, she still does today. And uh, she works very hard. She, at the time, she was working three different jobs. And uh, she worked very hard to provide for my sister and I so we can have the best life possible. And my dad had been a truck driver for many years, a diesel mechanic and a plumber. And he also had worked as a, a home builder. Uh, years before all of that, he had been a machinist. And then he was in the Navy. He was an underwater welder. So you can see my dad had a lot of diversity. On my mom's side, she really wanted to be a teacher, and she was an excellent educator, and um, really someone who inspired my sister and I to just be the best that we could be. So I feel like we really had the perfect uh, parents in terms of inspiring us to do great things with our lives. And we were always told, you can do whatever you want. So uh, in my mind, I was thinking, well, I wanna go to college, and maybe I wanna study math, or sciences or music. And uh, that was a huge shock for my family because really that wasn't the thing you do. You don't normally go to college. So that was kind of an outside shot, but I applied. I got into a, a really good music school. It was very strong in the sciences. And uh, I started as a math major and then I became a psychology minor uh, as well as musical composition and then a trumpet performance major. Um, so I didn't really do the math anymore, but I was very heavily invested in my time in math and sciences. So I was still doing physics and math. And when you combine all those things, um, I suddenly found myself in a position where I loved to play the trumpet, but I was not very good at it. And because I wasn't good at it, I was trying to find ways to improve. So I was working on a physics model to understand how the embouchure worked and how the instrument worked. While working on that physics model, uh, I found myself in the lab studying the actual instruments. Um, one big part of the physics, physics model is how the instrument works. And in trying to uh, improve my own playing on any instrument, I also discovered the principles that make acoustic instruments work, especially brass instruments. And I stumbled upon a way to make them better, to increase the efficiency and then create a variable performance system. And those ideas stuck with me. Uh, it became such a part of the way I was thinking that not only did, it, did I overcome pretty much all of my performance issues, which were mostly based on uh, lack of education, lack of understanding how the embouchure and the whole mechanics worked. Once I solved those things and I understood it, I came up with exercises that allowed me to play really well. Even though I was a horrible player, I then made the transition. It took many years to do that. Um, but then I also started building trumpets and experimenting with them, and it became a trumpet business. So, uh, you know, despite having lots of different jobs doing different things, I became a trumpet builder, and here I am today, 20-some uh, years later, of course, building some of the best trumpets in the world, and I have to say, uh, definitely trumpets that are the most efficient and the most versatile. We can really set them up for anybody. So uh, that's how I really got started building trumpets in a nutshell. And where that has taken me is uh, down the path of being a machinist and an engineer and a designer, um, of course, a professional musician, a lot of other things. So um, I'm, of course, just having a great time designing trumpets and building trumpets and the Nouveau, even though it was a, a design I came out with many years ago, built on my very first desktop milling machine. It now today has stood the test of time and uh, it is just this beautiful rendition of art meets uh, function. And it's a beautiful instrument. I can't wait to finish this one. So we're gonna be looking at different parts of the process to build these braces and to build the instrument and we'll explore the instrument itself and then you're going to hear me play it in the end several times to hit all the sides uh, to make the finished product which was this brace right here so let me get that up on the screen you can see it's a fairly complex brace and this brace is one of two that goes on 
the trumpet. So I finished the trumpet, we finished the build, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then we will look at it again once we have it all cleaned up. Because right now, it just came out of the soldering hood, and it's been laser welded, silver soldered, and soft soldered. Everything's assembled, and now we need to brush it down and put it all together. So, those braces are on the top here. And even though they look the same, they're different. Let me turn it over. They are different because uh, you have to account for the way they fit on the valve casing here, which I've done, and they're the same that way. But the one that goes against the bell here is different than the one that goes against the lead pipe. So uh, the way that they are machined um, on the radius is completely different on each of these. Things. So let me get that up there close so you can see it. The cool thing about these braces is they're very efficient. They're also very decorative. And it's a lot of fun to build a high efficiency horn that has incredible versatility while making it look really cool. The truth is this horn right now looks pretty gross because we've got anti-flux all over the place up here. And then uh, we have flux and solder in all of these crevices. You can see that we had quite a bit of heat in this area to heat up that brace before we did the soldering. Uh, it takes quite a bit of solder to fill that cavity. Even though it's a very good fit, it's not perfect, so there's a lot of solder fill. And keep in mind, almost all these parts were machines. Um, the only parts that weren't machines on this horn right now were these nickel tubes you see on the slides. Uh, the rest of it, and then these crooks, those were not machined. Everything else was machined. So this belt crook, was machines, that's five pieces. There's two halves, and then there's a coupler here, and two more couplers. Those are specific to each individual's order. Uh, this little brace was machines. That little brace was machines. The entire tuning slide, again, that's four pieces when you count the nickel tubes. And, uh, oh, of course, the bell was not machined. It was fabricated. So, and that bell is our number 11. It's a red brass. This horn, it may look somewhat heavy. It really isn't that heavy, but it's one of the heaviest ones we make. So when it's done, it's probably gonna be three and a half, maybe a little more pounds. So it's a, a nice horn. And the next step will be to brush all of this off and then move on to, move on to scraping it. So we take hand scrapers and we have to go through and scrape all of these little tiny nooks and crannies to get all that solder off of the horn. Uh, that can take several hours to even a couple days. A horn like this, uh, because it has so many crevices, it's going to take probably 50 to 100% longer than a normal horn, just because there's so many spots to hit. And then the final cleanup, again, it's going to take a lot longer than normal. Uh, the only thing I have left to do on this horn is engrave the bottom caps. So we have three quarter inch bottom caps for this horn and the customer will have his monogram on those. So first, middle, and last initials uh, on one, two, and three um, facing the other way. And then after that, you know, we really just clean it all up, do the final assembly if it doesn't get any uh, plating, uh, play test it, and then we ship it out to the client. And this one is going to New Orleans, Louisiana. So uh, that's our next step. Just remember, we went from this on that one brace to this. We made two of those to get this horn together. And that's just one piece, well, really two pieces, of this entire horn. We had to do something similar to make the receiver, which again, comes off. And each segment, there are five segments of that lead pipe. The finger rings were made that way. The, the tuning slide, the belt crook, the bracing, all of this was made with that kind of uh, care and uh, quite a bit of time and energy. Hey, Jen. Hi. Uh, how's the horn going together? Good. Pretty smooth. Yeah? What are you working on? I've just been getting the valves lapped, cleaned. Nice. Well, that looks really nice. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, once that's done, then um, I will review the horn and play it for you. So the Nouveau trumpet is finished. We watched Jen 
as she worked on locking the pistons and the slides. Joe and Christine helped us do all the finishing on the horn. And this entire video is about the Nouveau. Well, I am really excited to tell you that it's right here. This is the Nouveau trumpet. It's finished. Check out this beautiful horn. So we have the machined bell crook, style D. Uh, we have a red brass bell. This horn has a machined tuning slide and bell crook. So we saw some of that. And uh, the machined lead pipe, the Venturi gap receiver, which is removable. So you can adjust your flexibility, your sliding, your airflow, and the 5mm modular mouthpiece. But the centerpiece of this horn are these braces right here. This is what makes the Nouveau. So we have blue, yellow, and purple finger buttons and the beautiful Nouveau braces that were inspired by nature and machines uh, really with a lot of love and time and effort. Here it is. You want to hear me play it? I cannot wait to play this horn. <laughs> I've only played a few notes on it. This feels really nice. Now, I used to play the first Nouveau trumpet that I built many years ago, and then I uh, built another one several years ago and donated it to Satchmo Summerfest in New Orleans. And I have not had one in many years in my possession. This is the new 2018 model. It is machined and designed very different than the previous models, but it still retains a lot of the same aesthetics. So this is our new bow trumpet and I'm excited to build a couple more to put on the walls here at Harrelson Trumpets in Denver so that you can come in and play them check them out yourselves and I want to thank you for joining me this week on shop talk at Harrelson Trumpets and uh, next week we have a lot of really exciting things for you in store so I'll see you then <laughs>